Dr. Patricia Wirakun, or Auntie Pat, uh, you are a sexologist. Mm -hmm. I've, I've never been a sexologist, mm -hmm. so I don't know what that involves. Um, could Would you, you like to be one? Well, let's find out. Could you okay. tell me what being a sexologist involves? A sexologist is basically a scientist or a person who researches sex, writes about sex, reads about sex, speaks about sex, teaches sex, and uh, does a bit of sex therapy and just manages to keep a little time to have sex. Just a little bit, just a little bit. Uh, but you know what you're talking about, so that's good. Um, so, what is, uh, so give us an average day in the life of a sexologist. So what does all that look like nine to five? Um, sort of starts at like about 4.30 in the morning and I do writing, I, I have three non-fiction books but I also like to do creative writing so from 4.30 or 5 o'clock to about 7.30 is my writing time then I wake up my husband and then the rest of the day just happens. Okay, um, now you've, uh, you've worked in a few different places, studied in a few different places, could you give us uh, sure. maybe a, uh, oh, a 60 second life okay. history? Okay, I was born in the tea plantations of Sri Lanka and grew up there. I'm a Tamil, Sri Lankan Tamil, and then went to medical school in Sri Lanka, so graduated as a doctor, got married to the enemy, a Sinhalese, if any of you know about Sri Lanka. Mm. That's the two groups. And then <coughs> after my graduation and getting married, I went to Hawaii to do postgraduate study. That's where I got into sex. Great place to get into sex, Hawaii, if you're thinking about it. And then when finished studying there with uh, a sexologist, went back to Sri Lanka and for six years I was the only sex therapist in the country. It's a kind of busy time with 20 million population and uh, 26 years ago we migrated to Australia. So for 24 years I worked at the University of Sydney and for the last eight, seven years I was director of a graduate program in sexual health. And I retired in 2012 thinking I was going to do creative writing and really relax. But the good Lord had different <laughs> plans. And so I've been writing through, but three books which are available there for you to look at there. And I've also managed to do a bit of creative writing and... So Despair? like romantic novels, that kind of thing? Yeah, well I've got one coming out actually from a Brisbane publisher called Risa Press that's um, based on the tea plantation and... Uh, Romantic. Oh, that's nice. There you go. Yes. It's the slightly Christianized, slightly integrous romance competitor to Mills and Boons. Oh, yes. Sounds like a good read. Um, so you speak to a, quite a variety of different people. You speak to pastors, you speak to parents, you speak to teenagers. Um, let, let me ask you about uh, what, do you, what, do you love, uh, what do you love about speaking to teenagers? Do you enjoy that part of your job? Oh, I love speaking to teenagers because, just to put it very succinctly, I guess, they are the future and they're living in the most confusing world. And so anything that any of us can do to assist teenagers is to, to live their lives in a way that makes sense to themselves and to society and as Christians basically to live their life in an integrous way that is in keeping with God's pattern and to understand that that is the best for their lives really works and that's why I enjoy being with teens. Excellent. Well, thanks very much for coming tonight. We, we, all of us in this room share a particular task, uh, be us parents, youth leaders, uh, members of, of this church community, members of our, of our community here on the Gold Coast. Uh, we all have a role to play in helping young people to grow up, particularly uh, in this world which is very different, a uh, hyper-sexualised place. Uh, and so each of us has a, a stake in, in this issue. And so we're really looking forward to mm -hmm. hearing you tonight, bring some wisdom, uh, help us understand uh, how it is that young people can grow up in a healthy and godly way in this world. So I'll hand over to you, Auntie Pat, and uh, look forward to the next little while. Thank you. Thank you. And it's great to be here with you today. Um, Young people today live in a cyber-connected global village. For them, ah, technology, there we go. For them, friends are counted by Facebook contacts and Twitter followers, identities, often an online profile, an Instagram or even an avatar. And their role models are very often either half-drunk 
sports stars or maybe twerking pop stars and if you don't know what that is go ask your teenager and knowledge for young people today is available 24/7 and only just a click away now my brothers and sisters in Christ this is the z generation or the z generation and today these teenagers are the most connected socially aware advertised to and sexualized generation who ever walked this planet these are your children these are the teenagers and therefore we must recognize that ignorance is no longer an option we cannot say that by not talking to them we're going to keep them pure and innocent it is not going to work because they are the children who are the cyber connected internet generation this is a fact and there's no way we can get away so what are we going to do today what we are trying to do with young people and what i am passionate about is to challenge our young people to live a life of sexual purity and integrity and to do that we are going to challenge our young people to be counter cultural to what the world is telling them to what the world is asking them to do to what the world is telling them is the best thing for their life we are telling them that god's pattern is actually a better pattern for their life so ladies and gentlemen my brothers and sisters in christ this is what i want would like you to get out of today i would like you to understand why it is so important that at this teen age the brains of our young people are so vulnerable and just to give you a little bit about the science behind that and then build on that why and where our young people look for their identity and can we give them a better model and when it comes to sex in this hypersexualized society our young people ask questions they just don't want to hear don't do it they want to know why what's happening in our body and our brain and why is it that god's word works why is god got a what's this pattern god's got and why does it make sense so we um, i'd like to talk to you a little bit about the science and society and god's word and finally our young people today live in what we call a gender variant world the challenge to our young people is how do you know who you are sexually or in anything but particularly sexually how do you know who you are unless you try it out so experimentation is very much a part of our young people's world from the time they are very little so i would like to end by talking a little bit about gender variance but i'm only going to give you a really really tiny teaser because you're going to come back on sunday to get the full talk on gender so it's only a 30 second teaser that you're going to get on that last section so let's start with the brain teen brains are vulnerable why as you know during puberty hormones kick in and it's not for nothing that we call them the sex hormones because teenagers as you all know you or some of you look like you're not that far away from being teens yourself you will remember those feelings of teenage hormones kick in and they cause body changes and that's kind of obvious to everybody but the brain changes are really based on fairly recent research where there's now we have the techniques of like functional magnetic resonance imaging and pet technology and we can actually study what's happening in people's brains and what we find is that the teen brain or the developing brain at puberty is what we call a work in progress what does this mean it means that the brain is going extensive remodeling like a network upgrading a computer system or you know a network upgrading of some sort continuously in a process we call pruning gardening term pruning happens the networks the connections of nerve cells or neurons that are used are kept and the ones that are not used basically wither and die and there is a biological basis but what we know today and that's why it's in big bold letters is that everything that goes into the brain 
It happens all your life, but particularly at the teenage will affect this wiring. We call it the science of epigenetics, where you start with a genetic basis, a pattern, but everything that goes in socially, nature, nurture, so the nurture bit, everything that goes into a teen brain is going to affect that wiring. Now this is happening throughout the brain, but I just want to talk to you about two important parts of the teen brain. The first I call the volcano brain. It's a great word to use for teenagers because basically it's the part of the brain that's erupting. It's the brain part that is telling them, I am growing up and I want to map it now. It's got to happen now. I can't wait. So the, under the testosterone and estrogen and all these hormones kicking in, lots of things happen. But one of the things is that need for independence and self-identity. Remember, there was a time when your kids were happy to hold your hand and cross the road. And there comes a time when they go, oh, mom. Because in their brain, they're thinking, I can think of someone else who might rather be holding my hand. And they want, and then there was a time when your daughter or son was so pleased when someone said, Oh, you look just like your daddy. There comes a time when they say, You look just like your daddy. And, they, and he looks and thinks, Fat and bald? Oh, no. <laughs> and you know, they don't want, they don't, they don't want that family. I just, not that they don't love you, but they want, independence they want their own identity and it is a good thing because otherwise they'll be 40 and still snuggling up on your lap and that would be most uncomfortable with your arthritis but the reality is that independence and identity is important but the question is when they're moving away from you and finding their independence who are they getting dependent on their friends and the peer group and therefore the peer group becomes very very important at this age of the brain developments you can see the implications here independence is good but who are they getting dependent on so there's independence identity and this volcano brain is telling them you want quick results you want to take the risks that's important for learning you know to learn new things you need to take the risks you need to learn new things but it's also got the dangers of quick rewards quick rewards don't tell me I've got to study a lot because in 10 years I'll be happy I want to know what's going to happen in five minutes so that is the volcano brain now that's a good thing but it's it's erupting now while that's happening other parts of the brain are developing much slower and the parts of the brain that we call the cortex, the frontal parietal lobe, the part of the brain that's influencing self-control and decision-making, the executive functions of emotional regulation and reasoning, these don't mature till well into the 20s. So I call it the wet rag. So we got a volcano brain with a wet rag trying to hold it down. So when a young person's brain is faced with a decision for an activity, the reward system, the volcano brain, the risk-taking brain, the sexual, I want to try this brain, is going to take precedent over the, whoa, wait a minute, wet rag. You know, got this picture, should I send it? Wet rag's going, think, 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 but the reward, the volcano's going, Press send. So you know when you think your teenagers are out of control? They are. It's just the way their brains are made. And you're like thinking, why did God do this for goodness sake? God is God. Didn't he have a better pattern? You see, God knew exactly what he was doing there as elsewhere. And there he said, I'm going to give them an external control system. What do you think he called them? Parents, youth workers ministers, church. You, my dear brothers and sisters in Christ, are the external control system to every child in this church. Every child in this church is watching you and learning from you. Your talk, your behavior, how you treat each other is getting wired into every young brain around you. It's not just the youth worker's job, it's not just the minister's job, it's the it's a family responsibility. We know that this is so important. So, 
One, they need help. Two, I said everything that goes in to the brain is wiring it. What is going into your teenager's brains? What goes in? What TV programs are they watching? What are they watching on the internet? All this is so important. Do you know what's going into your children's brains? And I said the friends, third point, friends, peer group. Are you aware who their friends are? Who are the young people? Who are their role models? Extremely important. You, they are going to influence. So that's just the brain. And you can see how important it is. This teen age. Now I said there were, identity is very important and the sexual behavior, the sexual feelings. So let me spend a few minutes talking about identity. As I said, they want to be independent, teenagers, and it's a good thing. Now, when I was writing the first book called Teen Sex by the Book, I did a number of focus groups with young girls and boys. And one of the things I asked them was, what does it, what does it take? What, what do you want to be somebody in the society today? What does it mean to be somebody important or significant? And what they would say is, we want to be like other people like our friends, but we also want to be liked by our friends. And of course, the more likes we have on our Facebook, the better. So what does it take to be like and be liked? And they say, yes, to be like, we've got to be like everyone else. But to be truly liked and be different, we have to be better than or have more than others. So have that little bit extra. So whether it be sexier or, you know, have better shredded abs or six pack or a better tie gap or whatever, I have to have more or be better. It's a self-perception. And that's not enough. I have to also project it to the world in cyberspace. Dear brothers and sisters in Christ, do you know what your child or the children in this church, what their Facebook profiles are. Do you know that? I ask young people and they say, you know, they all know someone else who has put up a picture of themselves which is interestingly sexy and then gone back within two hours to see how many likes there are. And that happens all the time. I mean, I sometimes experiment. I change my profile picture and put up a picture of a gum tree or something. It's amazing that you'll have 10 likes in like two hours. Oh, really nice gum tree. Okay, fine. <laughs> but if people go and look. And so people look. And so it's like you count the likes. Now, in the world today, this projection of sexuality has become a courtship behavior. Recently, recent research done by La Trobe University, far down there in Melbourne, and uh, they interviewed over 3,000 young people, years 10 to 12. And what they found is when they looked at the whole sample, about 50% had received and sent sexually explicit texts, sexting, and about 25% had sent or received sexually explicit photographs, kind of selfies sexy selfies. Now, when they picked the ones who are actually sexually active, they found that over 80% had sent and received sexting texts, sexual explicit texts, and over 50%, in fact, up to 70% had received and sent photographs. So when I talk to young people, one, some of the things they tell me is, it's just part of our getting to know each other, sending pictures of our package. If you don't know that, I had to ask twice before I figured it out too. So, you know, you meet someone and this is what girls tell me. I've had a couple of girls tell me this. You go to a party, you give a tele your telephone number, you go home and there's a picture of his package sent to you. That's like, hi, this is me. Can I have a picture of you? And this is like the courtship behavior. We must be unashamed in talking to our young people that their bodies are far too precious to be used this way. And for that, my dear brothers and sisters in Christ, we need to be very clear where our identity is. And then we can talk to our children about their identity. If we don't do that, what we are seeing today is one of the commonest concerns especially in girls' schools and now in boys' schools is self-harm. 
that the number of the young people, and at this time when we thought it was only young girls, with 40, about 45% of teen girls and 20% of boys have serious concerns about body image, eating disorders. This is no longer just a few kids. Because that body, use of the body, showing it as a projection of who they are is becoming. And of course, if you can't do that, then you've got to be a bully and put other people down to make yourself feel better. This, almost 100% of young people will say they know somebody who has been bullied or is a bully. Teenagers. This is the reality of the cyber world. We have to unashamedly point to an identity that is not dependent on how sexy they are or how much they have or who they are or how beautiful they are or anything. My dear brothers and sisters in Christ, our children can be clearly pointed to an identity in Christ, that they are known by God, bought at a price and belong to God. I speak to teenagers and they tell me later that this has been so empowering to them that they don't have to go by the values of the world when it comes to their inner identity. And you might know, well, I haven't spoken to your children, but you might like to know that um, I tell young people, I say, look, if you read Psalm 139, it says, God knew you when you were knit in your mother's womb. When mom and dad were making whoopee, they were not thinking about your being knit in mommy's womb. They were having the best orgasm ever. But that moment when you were knit in mommy's womb, God said, yes, that's mine. And they're like, wow. And then say, why do you think they were so anxious that you come to the youth camp anyway? Oh, but that's just by the way. But the point is that it is good for your children to know that that they were known by God and you know that their bodies are not a commodity to be cheapened and put out there for people to perv over but their bodies as it very clearly says in 1 Corinthians 6 their bodies are made as something precious for them for their family and for God so to teach them from the time they are very very young that their bodies are immeasurably precious and not to be made a commodity. I tell young people when you put your pictures out there and people perv over them, it is the same as buying something not just from a designer shop, from the two dollar reject shop to be used, abused and thrown away. That is not the value God wants because you are created by him. So that is what, just a quick, sort of quick encapsulated identity talk for you to have with your children. Well, what about sex? Let's talk about sex. The sex talk. Now, the sex talk, what I want to clearly say, there is no specific time when you do the sex talk. The, uh, there is never a too early to start talking, age-appropriate discussion of sexuality, and I'm happy to take questions on this. Don't leave it too long, because then what happens to this dad will happen to you. Where you say, can we have, shall we have the talk? And the son says, okay, well, what do you want to know? So, what I'd like to do is talk a little bit, as I said, about the science of sex to start off with. This is research based again on functional resonance, magnetic imaging and all this science stuff with the brain done by a Professor Helen Fisher and her team in Rutgers and Europe. And this is very much accepted now of the three stages that you feel desire, you fall in love and then you move into a stage of attachment. So I'll be very brief here and I'm happy to take questions. Sexual desire is a brain chemistry in that deep emotional brain, you know the volcanic brain, we call it the limbic system. It's driven by testosterone, it is a urge of I want sex. It's not very specific, it's just like saying I'm hungry but I can eat a pizza, I can eat, you know, a slice of bread, you know, just whatever. But it's just that sort of I want. That's all it is, a want. Stay with me on that. It is, it changes from person to person, it changes with age, it's a big topic, sexual desire, but basically it's a I want. Starts at puberty and continues till your last breath in varying amounts. Then there is the falling in love. 
All of you, I'm sure, at some time have had this experience. You're sitting in church, there's a message, Zechariah, Lamentations, and suddenly you look across and there she is. And you have this heart palpitating, pupil dilating moment of sweating in the middle of a Gold Coast summer. And that moment, you know that she is the one. You want her in your arms, you want her in your life, you'd love to have her in your bed. And that is that moment of romantic love. I'm sorry, it's just a brain chemistry. There's a chemical called dopamine that starts in these reward centers and gets sprayed like the fireworks over the harbor bridge. Oops, wrong state. Um, you know, gets sprayed all over your brain. And I love it because it makes you dopey. Basically what it does, it takes all that I want of desire and it brings it into the motivation to be intimate with one person. Note I say intimate, not have sex with. It says, I'm going to take all this love energy and I want to know you, one person. And therefore, I will pursue you. Serotonin levels go down. It's the same thing that happens in obsessive compulsive behavior. Yes, falling in love is an obsession. The levels, the part of the brain that affects um, fear is suppressed. Yes, love is fearless. And the same chemical changes happen when you take a cocaine hit. Yes, falling in love is an addiction. And then, and this is my favorite, the parts of the brain that are associated, you remember the frontal lobes and things, with rational thinking are suppressed. Ever thought, what does she see in him? She doesn't. Love is blind. It takes those emotions of discernment and say, see only the best in this person. All that energy focused on this person and you can only see the best. Your lover is the best in the world. Now, isn't that something? Aren't you really glad it lasts only for 18 to 24 months at the best? I'm 41 years married and I do not palpitate every time my husband passes. I would have to increase my hypertensive medication every other day if that happens. And so what happens is when you are with someone, and you are intimate with that person, especially sexually intimate, different hormones kick in and you bond with that person. Oxytocin is the same thing that happens when a baby and a mother are together, suckling hormone, bonds the mother and the baby. When you have sex with someone, sexual intimacy sends oxytocin through the roof and you bond. So the more sex you have, you bond. And even one sexual intimacy causes a mini bond. That's important for young people to know. There is nothing called casual sex. You bond when you have sex. When you break up, it is painful because you have chemically, biologically bonded. We need our young people to understand this. There is truly nothing called casual sex. That is just the science. So let's move on to the world view. What does the world say? Remember when I said sexual desire, I said sexual desire is a I want sex. You know what your kids and you are also hearing from the world? Desire is a need. You want something? It's actually a need. How can you live without it? You have a right to self-gratification. What you need to gratify your urges. If you don't meet your needs, you're less than human. I'm saying things young people have told me. If I don't have sex, I am less than human. How can you be human and not have sex? Very well, thank you. I'm a doctor for 40 years and a sexologist for 30. I've seen people die of la lack of food, water, medication, healthcare. Not one empirically reported case of death by lack of sex. Not one. You know, I tell this to young people and they kind of look at me and going, really? <laughs> Can you live without sex? Yeah, very well. well. For many reasons, people do. But that's not what the world says. So whether it's homosexual, heterosexual, bestiality, whatever you want, you have a right to it. And don't let anyone tell you that you can't get it. Because that's evil. 
especially if they're Christians, it's super evil. And what about falling in love? Young people today and, I must say, adults of today can't make out the difference between the emotion of love and the action of making love. So falling in love, the emotion, is tied in with making love, the action. And if I love you, what I'm really saying is, I want your body to satisfy my needs, my cravings. We come back to this, I want you. That's what we understand love as. It feels good for me. If it feels good for me, I really don't care that much what it feels for you. And I want to use you. What, is our, what are our schools teaching our children? In case you're thinking that this is all being taught to them really well, basically schools are teaching what I call the three Ps. And that is that plumbing, pleasure and prevention. So what we are being taught in school, kids are being taught in school is the plumbing, yeah, you know, male, female plumbing, and it's good that they're taught that. But they're also being taught that sex is a very pleasurable thing. Yeah, sure, I just said that myself. Of course it's pleasurable, we all know that. Orgasms are great, they cause really nice chemicals and make you feel good. True. And then, because it's pleasurable, and now you know the plumbing, you know, it's taken for granted that you will have sex, so make sure that you use protection. Nothing on purity, nothing on making choices. They aren't going to hear it from school. If they don't hear it from you as parents, they don't hear it from the church, they ain't going to hear it from anyone else. They're in fact going to hear just the opposite. In a recent Latrobe study, that same study, almost half of the year 10 to 12 students said that their sex education was basically irrelevant to their lives and that they just made their own decisions. So. That is what the world is telling our children. Of course, when it comes to marriage, what marriage? It's all about love, isn't it? So you can basically marry who you want. So whether it comes to same sex, whether it comes to polyamory, polyamory is where groups of people just live together as if married, and we've got polyamory groups in Australia, and even what we would call incest, but what they call genetic sexual attraction. And that is family members getting married as long as they don't have children. And there's genetic sexual attraction groups in Australia. And these are all now saying, you know, we really, we really, you know, applaud our gay lesbian brothers for just opening the road for us to also now ask for the same things marriage equality. That's another whole story. We won't talk about that one. What I'd like to talk about now is just give you a few of the questions and concerns our children meet. And I'm going to be just introduce you to this so that we can come back if anyone has questions. Pornography. Porn is the curse of our generation, not just for young people. Porn use in the church is no is statistics albeit from America, say that when they do research, porn use in the church is no different from porn use out of the church, in for church attenders, non-attenders. Porn is anything that is sexually explicit and created to sexually arouse and titillate. It's not just the computer with the old man sitting with the towel over his head and masturbating. It's on the iPhone, it's in the books, it's the super erotica of Fifty Shades of Grey. It's in the movies. That's all porn. What does porn do? Porn rewires the, the circuits in the brain, the desire circuits in the brain. This is well researched. After a while, pornography, that porn desires will overtake and take over. Remember? What I said, everything that goes into the brain will wire the brain, will affect the wiring. That doesn't stop at teen years. Your brains remain neuroplastic. In other words, they're plastic. They can change. So when any of us feed porn into our brain, it is going to affect the wiring of our desire circuits. And after a while, every instance of sex is a pornified instance, a pornified experience, and normal sex becomes just boring. Normal people don't become attractive because our brains get pornified. That's a whole other area of discussion. But the research shows us clearly that in young boys whose 
watch porn and in my interviews some of the boys would say how else would we know what girls like except from porn i tell them no girl wants to be a porn star but this porn is the sex educator of our young people they begin to see girls as a commodity these are the ones who send their packages and ask the girls for their pictures and then distribute it to their friends porn viewers the boys will accept coercion forced sexual violence as actually a normal part of love making the rate of girls the instances of girls openly saying that their boyfriends ask them for anal sex that's rising significantly i talk to my friends who are in sexual health and they would say they're seeing more and more girls with like lesions in the anal area sexually transmitted infections in the anal area because you don't have to use a condom because you know you're not going to get pregnant so there's all sorts of problems that are coming out and this is a lot of it is porn driven what happens in girls girls are accepting what we call the raunch culture and making sexual objects of themselves i would speak to parents i would speak particularly to their fathers you need to be aware of what your children are doing especially your daughters are doing and wearing and just talk to them about the inner beauty and identity that does not mean they make themselves sexual objects i tell girls when i speak in girl schools you know what happens when you get out there and you look really sexy yes you look beautiful but guess what you're putting yourself out there to have some old man on the road perv over you is that what you want no we only just want our boyfriend to admire us you know that's not going to happen oh yeah you know this is the teen brain remember the volcano so the reality is that you are the ones who need to help them make that decision and pornography is something you need to know what your kids are watching the average age of first porn exposure in australia is 11 years you know this is the reality you're not going to be you how we need to start talking to our children really early about the dangers then of course the other question is isn't everybody doing it is everybody doing it in that same latrobe study we found that they found that 69% of this year 10 to 12 cohort are sexually active this means everything from deep kissing to sexual intercourse sexual intercourse being defined as anal or vaginal intercourse now deep kissing tongue kissing french kissing no idea i never kissed a frenchman but the reality is that 69% when it comes to oral sex 40% when it comes to sexual intercourse a quarter of year 10 a third of year 11 and 50% of year 12 have had intercourse anal or vaginal now the question here is is that everybody no it's not see we need to tell our children you know 31% or so have never had any form of sexual activity hey just a minute that's probably more than there are christians at that age cohort what do you know there are non christians who aren't sexually active why are you why do you think why are you believing the myth that everybody is doing it young girls today are having boys tell them if you don't have sex with me i'm going to put it on facebook that you're a lesbian or that you're frigid if you don't have sex everybody else is having sex i had a young man tell his tell his girlfriend i want to break off with you because all my other friends are having sex and i am abnormal in the group because i am not having sex and she came to me in tears of course i'm anti pat so everybody comes to me to tell them tell me all their sexual problems no that's not an open slide for all of you to start asking <laughs> although i'm happy to answer but anyway the point is that the reality is that our young people are being faced with these questions that last dot point i tell young people 28% of girls and one fifth of the boys who had had sexual intercourse said they were forced drugs rape alcohol coercion i tell them don't be a statistic don't become a statistic we need to talk to our children clearly about these another one they would say young people say is why wait what's your problem i can never get that right you know just got a particular teen way of saying it what's your problem why wait sex before marriage sex with someone to whom you have not made a lifelong commitment 
is dangerous for your health. Why? Firstly, the sexually transmitted infection rates in Australia for that age group, the 15 to 19, green, and 20 to 24, yes, they are dropping a teeny weeny bit in 2013. This is chlamydia. Chlamydia notifications are rising exponentially and just been dropping a little bit last year. Chlamydia is a sexually transmitted infection which has hardly any symptoms but leads to infertility especially in girls. One in five girls, we estimate, have, will have chlamydia infection. Sexual health physicians are looking at an epidemic of infertility when these kids start getting pregnant. That's gonorrhea rates. Gonorrhea rates, as you can see, in the age group, again, has dropped a little bit. But if you look at the 20 to 24, you can see how it's rising. This is a very real fact. Why are we seeing this? Aren't they using condoms? They are learning in school about it. Why are they not using? Hey, go back to the brain. Red, I want to make love to you. Oh, let's stop and buy a condom. Volcano brain, wet rag. Have a drink. They've just had a drink. No wet rag. What little wet rag they have is gone when you add alcohol or drugs to the mix. That is what is happening. So, it is dangerous for the health. I tell young people, you can, even when wearing a condom, it only covers the shaft of the penis. You can get warts. You can get genital warts. Of course, now you have the HPV vaccine, but, you know, the vaccine, but that's okay. You can get warts. You can get uh, herpes. You can get uh, pubic lice. As I said this in a girls' school. And they said, we never get pubic lice. We'll, none of us will get pubic lice. Because we all shave. So now I believe pubic lice are an endangered species in Australia. But anyway, so secondly, having sex, casual sex is bad for your mind. We just talked about bonding and our kids need to understand this. That rejection, breaking up is painful. It's like forming super glue with the people you have sex with. You have that, you break off, you leave a bit of yourself and you take a bit of that person with you. By the time you try to make a commitment, you are confused. And then you end up in the sex therapist's office saying things like, I love my husband so much, but I can't forget the women I've been with or the porn stars I've watched. I love my wife but I keep remembering those girls I've been with before. It stays in your memory. Our children need to understand that, that you pay a price for that kind of behavior. And then, you know, they need to understand, even for society, we have research now that tells us clearly that cohabitation, living before, together before marriage, is not working. We call that sliding and deciding. There's a lot of research on that. Living together leads to higher divorce, more dissatisfaction and marital dysfunction. And there's a book called Maybe I Do by Kevin Andrews the politician, who really has drawn all that research together. It's a really good book if you're interested in looking at the research. And of course, for us Christians, we know that God gives us a pattern for our life, and a pattern for the whole of our life that is healthy for us to live. And we, our sex life is only a part of it. But God gives us a pattern, and then God says, live this way, that we save sex for that wonderful covenantal relationship. It is not not because sex is bad or ugly. It is because it is beautiful that God tells us, keep it for somewhere where you can truly enjoy it in what he calls very clearly a naked and no shame relationship, a one flesh relationship. Don't be ashamed to talk to young people about what a naked, no shame, one flesh means. I mean, you know, I tell young people, I'll just tell this to you. I tell them, you know, when you make love, you take all your clothes off with somebody who's not a brother or somebody you know really well. So you're naked. Naked means you are totally vulnerable. That's why it's a no shame. So I ask them, would one of you like to, you know, come here and actually get nude and be comfortable? And I just keep hoping nobody volunteers. <laughs> you never know. And then I say, why would you do that? Why would you do that? Or how would you do that? You do that because you feel 
either one of two things either you're absolutely perfect and nobody is going not going to is going to find anything wrong with you or you trust everybody so much that they love you so much they're not going to find fault with you and nobody is perfect nobody Jesus was the only perfect man nobody on earth now is 100% not even Julia Roberts or Jolly or whoever it is nobody is 100% perfect even with all the plastic surgery but if you are totally sure that the person looking at you has loves you so much they know where all those wrinkles were 20 years ago or whatever and don't care because they love you that is no shame children need to understand that you know you need to be sure that the person you're with is somebody who is going to honor your body not use your body that's so important because god gives us a pattern you need god clearly says that sexual desire is powerful song of songs is very clear love is as strong as death song of songs tells us as jealousy as unyielding as the grave that's what it's like it's a powerful thing but god says it's powerful for a purpose my dear child and i give you self control self control the wet rag needs to be exercised and developed it's like the bible is clear flee from sexual temptation the bible says don't kind of sit there and think well, you know looks good get away from it it's a basis of treatment of everything even porn addiction and therefore the bible says self control fruit of the spirit develop it work on it we need to help our children and for that we need to work on it ourselves my dear brothers and sisters in christ it is what you do it is what you role model sex is caught in fact more than taught they watch you and learn same about love love is an emotion yes but it is also an action of honoring tell your young people when they are going on a date with someone is that person whether it's a boy or a girl choosing to honor your body or to use your body it is a honoring love is an action love is an action that keeps couples together through life You know when the dopamine and the serotonin levels have returned to normal and the oxytocin and prolactin are the, they are the ones that are bubbling along you know it's no longer like the fireworks over the harbor bridge or no not again but then it's more like a sizzle you know fireworks few firecrackers in the backyard but that is what keeps you together and don't be ashamed to let your children see you caring for each other as mom and dad cuddles by the kitchen sink are great and you know Yes put a lock on the bedroom door but if the kid walks in and sees you making love trust me it will not traumatize them for life it's much better they know that mom and dad love each other and want to be together than to not know that and not see that affection love is an action they need to know that because the world says oh it's just an emotion that you just have to have sex and that's it the action of honoring is important and of course marriage we know god is clear it's a place of promise keeping and we need to be showing it to our children in the church and out so this one is going to be very quick the lgbtqia world our children live in i told you this is the teaser so i'm not going to go into this in detail our children live in a gender variant world i don't know about queensland schools but out in new south wales we have um, gay pride and you know proud schools and all sorts of things we are under you know it's really anti bullying programs but the main main thrust of it is really about accepting all gender variants so your teenagers will know it all so let's see how much the church knows glbtqia are variants of sexual sexual gender variants let's see how how much you know g is for thank you l gay l for lesbian b bisexual oh you're good t transgender q queer or questioning very good i 
Intersects is there. Cheat, read down. Intersects A. <gasps> you are very good. 100% A for intersects. Uh, A for asexual. Asexual is basically people who just aren't interested in sex. And yes, there are people who just say, not interested. You know, like anything else, it's bell curve, there's lots of people there. Some people are easily aroused, so they would go as the ones who get very easily addicted to any sexual behavior. Then there are some people who just don't feel sexual, asexual. Now, we're going to talk about this on Sunday, but I just want to tell you there's more to gender than sexual orientation. There's biological, there's identity, and sexual orientation is a desire. And remember what we talked about desire? Desires are I want, and behavior is always a choice. More on Sunday. Okay, so the challenge to you as parents, as the church, is really about reflecting on our personal values and behaviors, individually, a couple, a church, and consider how we are communicating these to our children. Sex education is caught and taught. Let me tell you, my dear parents, establish rules and guidelines. You are a parent. Your children have 2,000 plus Facebook friends. They can do without two more, but they have only two and sadly sometimes one parent. When there is one parent, the rest of the church has a responsibility to provide the role models for these children. Take that responsibility seriously, my dear brothers and sisters in Christ. We talk of what we call authoritative parents, parents who have an authority but talk to their children, treat it as a democracy but a democracy with rules. Set boundaries, be supportive and nurturing. But once you set the boundaries, keep to the boundaries. Of course, that's a whole talk about parenting per se. But it's important for you to be a parent, to know that it is okay to set the boundaries and to keep to the boundaries. And if you set a penalty, you've got to be have the honesty and the integrity to actually keep to that penalty. And when we do that, the research tells us that kids are happy and capable and successful, although they may growl at you at the moment. So... That's about all really I want to talk, a bit of unashamed advertising. Those three books are available for you. Empire's Children is my creative writing, the novel that will be available apparently on the 1st of June in regular bookstores. That's my contact, so if you want to contact me and some questions don't get answered and you'd like to talk to me, feel free to email me. That's my Sydney Uni. I'm an honorary with the Sydney University program. And so feel free to um, email me. And that's my Twitter profile. The, that's my second name, my Twitter profile. And I often put tweets on current, of, current sexuality issues. So that's where I'd like to leave this. And yeah, I'll just leave. Okay. And move on to Q&A.